At Neighborhood Church Upper West Side here in New York City, our mission's simple, to love God and to love one another. Jesus said everything is about that. And so we do that through announcing and demonstrating the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're seeing people come to faith in Christ for the first time, as well as disciples growing and making other disciples. Being a part of community at Neighborhood Church has meant so much to me. I've been able to grow in my relationship with Christ, first and foremost, as well as meet a lot of great people and really challenging me in my faith. Uh, finding a church body that's a place we can come, that we can just have people that are like-minded with us, that we can go to with issues, that we can be challenged by. When I first moved here, I didn't know anybody. And not only was it like, hi, I'm so-and-so, nice to meet you, see you next week. It was a big emphasis on getting to know each other deeper and make like a real genuine connection and friendship and also get to know each other deeper in Christ. It really means that I have a family nearby, that I have a community and a place where I can like grow in my faith and I can serve the community. Neighborhood Church has really been an amazing community for me. Coming to New York where everything feels very big and crowded, it's really great to have a smaller place where I could come and know that there's people here supporting me and encouraging me specifically with the Word of God. I've made really good friends here and we have such a strong community that supports and encourages each other um, in our life and in our walk with Christ. Since the very beginning, Pastor Steve, Tony, and the rest of the church has, have really welcomed us with, with open arms. Uh, they've, they've invested in us and we couldn't just be more thankful for being part of this community, being part of Neighborhood Church. Going out and really building relationships in my workplace and through those relationships, get to show more of Christ every single day. How I reflect myself as a Christian in in front of other people, in front of my co-workers, in front of my friends. It's such a different place and it really does present a lot of ministry opportunities. Increasingly I felt more comfortable talking about God with other people. We really have to set ourselves apart and I think that through our actions and through our love and through the way that we carry ourselves, we really are able to show people Christ. To build those relationships that can then become gospel conversations. I've gotten the opportunity to disciple more people in the purpose of like why I'm alive and that life is to serve the Lord. In this big city, I can easily feel lost. Life here is a little bit hard. You can't do it alone. In a city that's not very patient and sometimes not the kindest. I've learned a lot actually from Neighborhood Church how to be a Christian in everyday life in this complex city. I have been called to be the light in the middle of the darkness, to come out of my shell and share the gospel with my friends, at my work, and with the people around me. Worldly things can't satisfy us and only Christ can complete our joy and that should change us and people should see that change and offer an opportunity for us to share Christ with them. But being reminded of the truths of the gospel, especially for us as we continue growing in our faith. It's really my second home. We're so grateful for your partnership, your support, your love and encouragement. Um, I want to be an encouragement to you today and let you know it is working. But of course it is, because God is faithful, right? And He's working, and He's working through uh, your support, through your obedience, and through ours uh, to take the gospel to a lost and broken city. And so let me say thank you from myself and the Chambers family, but also from the people here that you may never meet, but whose lives are being changed forever with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Man, that is... That's an encouragement to me every time I watch it because <clears throat> y'all make me cry all the time. <laughs> so do they. Because when I look at those people on that video and others, <clears throat> I see lights. The light of Christ. And we gather together, <clears throat> we encourage each other every week. We get into the word of God and we stoke that fire, right? Like you guys are doing tonight, like you did this morning, like we do as the church. And then those people, every one of them, are going out into many different circumstances, many different kinds of jobs and 
colleges and all kinds of stuff, and they are taking the light of Jesus Christ. It's been such a blessing to see them get it, you know, to get that we are all called to be on mission. <clears throat> well, such a blessing to be with y'all tonight. Thank you so much, Pastor Paul, for allowing me to, to share a message with you tonight. I was thinking about it as I was sitting there. My sermons are starting to, they kind of ring the same bell all the time. Uh, but you'll get it. It makes sense. Um, uh, our family right now is on a little trip of building partners uh, uh, all the way, meeting with churches and pastors and also visiting schools for Ruby. Believe it or not, she's a junior. We're starting to look at colleges, uh, opportunities for her. And, um, and so we've talked with pastors and churches and looked at schools from New York to Virginia, North Carolina, South Florida, uh, up to uh, Birmingham uh, this week and other places, um, six or seven different churches and pastors. I spoke with two this morning, uh, different churches and covering about 3,500 miles, uh, about six different colleges. We're trying to do it all in one trip. Um, so if I just fall down up here, you know why. We've been on the road all this time. But we are definitely going, going, going. God has called us all to go, and not, not necessarily in the way that we've been going these last, this last week, but we are all called to go. You know, the nation... If I were to ask you, do you think the nation is becoming more or less Christian? More or less people identifying as Christ followers? Or, or what about the, the opinion or the perspective of Christians in the world and in, in our nation, in our culture, per se? Well, the statistics show that we are Christianity, people that are claiming Christ as Savior is going down something like 10% every decade at this point, which is a little scary. And of course, Jesus said they would hate us, they would hate, some would hate the message, and so there's that aspect of it. But we as the church, if we're called to bring the message of Christ, if we're called to see Christians grow and come to faith in Christ, what is the strategy? How do we stop this? How do we change the trend? Do we put a fresh coat of paint on our buildings? We come up with some different programs maybe? The answer is to go. The answer is to go for every single one of us. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, right? Before he left, go and make disciples. What's the solution today? What's the solution to, to world war? What's the solution to the conflicts going on around the world? People in this room, people who claim to know Jesus as Savior, going. That's the solution. What's the solution for the Middle East conflict? Going. You and I, what's the Solution to the epidemics and pandemics and immigration difficulty. What's the solution to mental health crisis, sexual, gender dysphoria and disorders? What's the answer? Going. Men and women being reconciled to God so that as we sung, the kingdom of God, as it is in heaven, comes to earth, right? Salvation, redemption. The message of Christ going forth. That's the solution. I have people all the time when the headlines say something different or we have people outside of our church protesting about Gaza or Israel or whatever the case may be. We need to make a statement. Here's the statement. Be reconciled to God. There will be no peace treaty that lasts in the Middle East. None. We can talk about it, we can change politics, we can redo it and everything. It won't last, it will not bring peace. There will not be peace here in our own nation without the church of Jesus Christ going into the darkness, into the lostness of the world around us through the power of the Holy Spirit moving and working through you and through me, the people in this room. Now, for us to answer this call, we must settle something in our hearts. 
this evening. And that is this. Your life is no longer about you. Primarily, your life is no longer about you. My little world, it's no longer about my little kingdom, right? It's not about my career or yours. It's not about my retirement. It's not about my spouse. It's not primarily about my children or my grandchildren. Now, some of you are like, yeah, just wait till you have grandchildren. They are the center of the world. But our lives are no longer about pursuing those things. The greatest thing you can do for your children and for your grandchildren is to be a person, one of the few people, even few, proclaiming Christians to live out your faith in this broken world. Live it broken and spilled out with the gospel all around you. David Platt wrote, We are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. And so, tonight we're going to look at the 8th chapter of Acts um, and see the example of such a person. I didn't do any slides, uh, so you have to get out a book if you want to follow along, or your device. I'll allow it. Um, We are going through the book of Acts at Neighborhood Church, and we started in October. I just preached Acts chapter 11 (laughs) after all this time. It is slow. We are going slow. Just when I think I'll skip a little bit, I come to a passage. I know that we got to go. We got to do that. So we are in uh, chapter 11, but I want us to look at Acts chapter 8 tonight as we look at, you know, Acts has been described as the Acts of the Apostles. Really, it's the Acts of God. The unstoppable power of God building his church and moving the gospel from a small handful of fishermen to you and to me here tonight. So Acts chapter 8, we'll begin reading in verse 26 through verse 40. And it says this, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. <clears throat> but Philip found himself as at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, communicate the word to our hearts tonight. And may we be doers and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an important passage of scripture in the life of the church because we see in Philip the fulfillment of Jesus' call to go, right? The church had been in Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. You remember that early in the book of Acts, the beginnings of the church gathering. They were meeting one another's needs. They were teaching Uh, the apostles' teachings. They were selecting deacons to serve in the church. 
<clears throat> excuse me, Peter and John in and out of Jerusalem prison system, and then the murder of Stephen and the dispersion of the church. And now in Philip, we see the individual believer going. Philip was part of this dispersion from Jerusalem. And he was going himself. And he comes to this Ethiopian eunuch. There's much to say about the Ethiopian eunuch, but I'm not going to uh, spend much time on that this evening. But I will say he was a man of influence to some degree. He had a scroll which typically costs a lot of money. It's not easily acquired at the time. And yet he was a man of success. He was trusted. And yet he was searching. He was hungry to know what the scripture says and what they meant. And the Holy Spirit was already working in this man. And so what I want us to look at this evening, just a couple points on this passage of what God is doing, how God is accomplishing his purposes, his purposes. And as we look through the book of Acts, we see the account of God doing miracle after miracle, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, saving souls. And he chooses to work through people like Philip, like you and like me. And so what does that mean for us? What can we learn from this passage of scripture of what does it mean to go? Well, first of all, what it means to go is to be available. Be available. In verse 29, it said, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. Back up in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Philip was available. Philip was listening Philip was leaving a productive ministry to go to the desert. He had just come from, he was in Samaria, and they, see, they were seeing this great revival. They were seeing this great spread of the gospel. It says, that, um, it says that there was much joy in that city. They were seeing the miracle of the Samaritans coming to Jesus. Simon had just dealt with uh, um, Philip just dealt with Simon the magician. God was working through him. And then the angel of the Lord comes and says, I want you to head <clears throat> to the desert place. There are two roads going from Jerusalem to Gaza. And this one is seldom used. There's nobody there. And he tells Philip, that's where I want you to go. Leave this big celebration. Leave this big revival and go. This would be foolishness in the eyes of men. This would be foolishness in the eyes of many... Seminary professors. But we see God moving in his church, and now we see God moving in Philip, this individual particularly. He was available. What it means to be available is, number one, you're possessed by Jesus, right? You're possessed by Christ. You know him as Savior in this relationship. Philip knew Jesus as Savior. He had responded to Jesus' call. Right? He was one of the first, Peter and Nathaniel and Andrew, and he had seen the risen Jesus. Philip had surrendered his life to Christ as Master and Lord, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Listen, here's a hard word tonight. If you have no desire to share Jesus with the lost world, maybe you have some unfinished business with Jesus. For me, I know who I was. I know where I was. And I know that Jesus, in his grace and mercy, reached out, reached in to the ditch and picked me up. <laughs> And put me here. It's all Jesus. When we know Jesus is Savior, we're possessed by him. We can't help but tell it. We can't help but share it. Now I can't see my notes.
Nothing else matters if Christ is not Savior and King of your heart and life. Nothing else. It's not religion. It's not about family. Christianity is not just another way of living. To be a Christian means Jesus is King. Period. And what that means is you recognize that you're a sinner, right? You recognize that you're a sinner. You recognize that Jesus is God's son and died for your sin and rose again. You confess and repent of your sin and you set Christ as Lord of your life. And everything changes. Can I get a witness? Everything changes, amen? My desires, the way I see the world, the way I see my neighbors changes. And the hard part is that happens. The Holy Spirit does that in me. And then the culture begins to draw me back into my comfort zone. Begins to draw me back into what is acceptable around me. Other pursuits. Philip belonged to Jesus. He was possessed by him. But he was also obsessed with Jesus. He knew him as Lord. Paul talks about this in this beautiful Passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God. God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul was obsessed. We were studying, I don't remember if it was this passage of scripture or not, but having this kind of discussion and somebody who is not a believer, who's been coming to small groups, she she piped up at one moment. She goes, doesn't this seem a little much? <laughs> it's a little obsessive, don't you think? Exactly. Sometimes God gives you a confirmation that you're doing the right thing. And in what she said, it was a confirmation. Yes, you're getting it. It is a bit much. To be possessed and obsessed with Jesus Christ, it's everything. Listen, the people around you in our culture and in New York City are struggling. They're struggling to to find meaning in life. They're struggling to find purpose. This is it. Jesus is it. Knowing him, following him, listening to him, obeying him. Now, this may be different than what you heard as a child. You may have grown up in a family where this is not, or a church where this wasn't exactly what you learned. Maybe a different kind of Christianity that's been modeled for you or just an addition to your life. Maybe it's just a a good way to live life. But listen, Jesus has to be everything. Because otherwise, this is what happens. Otherwise, you'll come to a place at some point in your faith and in your life where you know what? It's just not enough. Church is just not enough. It's boring. I don't really get anything out of it. I don't really, you know what? The church is not really, not really meeting my needs or I start to become easily offended because Jesus is not on the throne. I'm not obsessed with walking with him, praying Praying just is dry. Reading my Bible is just not enough. Jesus is fine. I get it, but it's just not enough. Listen, Jesus will not stay in your back pocket. That's not why he came. He came as King of kings and Lord of lords. He wants all of your life, all of it. So this evening, what are you hanging on to? What is preventing Jesus from being your obsession, number one in your life? Philip is both available 
and he is attentive to his master. He is possessed by Jesus. He is obsessed with him, and he is sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 29, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. Do you hear the Spirit in your life? Do you hear the Spirit speaking to you? Are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Do you have a desire to hear the Holy Spirit? It's not passive. Listening, number one, we have to listen, right? We have to be sensitive to it. It's not passive. It's intentional. It's ready, poised to hear. It's making space in my life to hear the Holy Spirit. When you hear a message, are you hungry for God to speak to you? It means I'm aware that God is speaking and I expect it. I expect the Holy Spirit to speak to me. Do I see everything, every interaction, every circumstance and situation as an opportunity for God to speak to me? Because he is speaking. To expect the Holy Spirit. To expect God to move. Recently, I was in a coffee shop. Surprise, surprise. It's where I do a lot of my studying. And I was studying for a passage, uh, for a message on a passage of scripture. And I had my little ear pods in, and I'm studying, and a lady came in. As soon as the door opened, you know, New York people just coming and going, coming and going, and usually looking at the ground. The door opened, and it was right next to me, and so the door opened, and she looked right at me, and she had this big smile on her face, and her eyes connected connected with mine and I just looked at her and it surprised me and I was just like oh yeah <laughs> tried to throw a smile in there real quick and then she went and got a coffee and I got back to work well in a few minutes I, I noticed she sat down right next to me about two seats over and I had my ear pods set to where you can hear outside too I don't know what that's called but um, I could hear and she said what are you writing to me and I was like oh uh I'm writing a sermon, a message. I'm a pastor. Oh, that's beautiful, wonderful. We need more of that. We need good, you know, news. She didn't mean the gospel. She just meant we need good, positive, you know, vibes. Um, I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, that's what I'm doing. So I put my ear pod back in and got back to work. I had a message to prepare. A few, few minutes later, she goes, oh, excuse me, <laughs> what are you writing? Um, I'm writing about how God's love is unconditional. We don't have to earn it. He loves us. He proved that. He shows that every day, and he showed that in Christ. You know? Oh, that's so beautiful. That is, that is beautiful. You know, that does my heart good, you know, because we don't, we don't manipulate love, right? We don't, she was talking, and we were talking for a while. Yeah, yeah. And I had my ear pot in my hand, like, I'm ready to get back to work. I was like, Mm hmm Yeah, exactly. You got it. That's it. Okay. All right. Put my ear pod back in. Started working some more. And then she goes, excuse me. <laughs> One more thing, she said. I won't bother you anymore. That's what she said. She said, this morning, I'm from L.A. I just flew in from L.A. And I, she flew in to have lunch with somebody. Um, she said, I just flew in to have lunch. She goes, but when I left the, my house this morning, I said, I prayed for a miracle today. You know, there's people all over wanting a miracle. Lost, broken, hopeless, whispering, I need a miracle. <laughs> but she said, something out of the ordinary, something beautiful. And I just want you to know, that this conversation is that. And the light went off and I finally got it. <laughs> this is a God moment. <laughs> Took my ear pods out, <laughs> put them down. And I looked at her and I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I said, you know what? When you walked in, you looked at me and caught my eye. And I thought, actually, I thought it was a little weird. Uh, I said, but now that you say that, I realize you prayed that prayer and then you were waiting for it. You were expecting it. You were walking in every door going, 
right here? Is this going to be it? I said, that's beautiful. You know, my, my uh, walk with Christ is that way all the time. I'm constantly, I started to, you know, draw on the net a little bit. And it's funny, if some of you who hunt know what I'm talking about, you, sometimes you see a deer out there, and all of a sudden, you're trying to get in position to get it, and all of a sudden it goes. And that's what she did. She sensed, uh-oh, he's coming for me. <laughs> and as I'm speaking, she got her stuff. She said, okay, great to meet you. Have a great day. And she was gone. I was sitting there like. Did you, God, did you just want me to take those out or what? But you know what? She taught me a lesson. When we are possessed and obsessed with Jesus Christ and we are led by the Spirit, we are expecting him. When we are praying for our neighbors, we are praying for God to open a door of conversation with the person at my job or in my school, Lord, then we are expecting it. We are looking for it. That's how we are available. That's how you and I can be available in our everyday lives. Now, I know some of you said, uh oh, he said be available. He's going to start having a sign up sheet for New York City. That's true, also. <laughs> I highly recommend New York is a great place to be available. So be available. Philip was available, but also be prepared. In verse 31, the eunuch said, How can I? know what this means unless someone guides me. In verse 34, and the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Listen, Philip was a fisherman, right? A simple guy, but he knew the word. He knew scripture. He knew the gospel. And he knew it in such a way that he could navigate. You want to start in Isaiah? Let's start in Isaiah. Wherever you want to start, let's start there. He was prepared. In our neighborhood, in the Upper West Side in New York City, people are experts in a lot of things. And they think they're experts in a lot of things. And some have had some exposure to Christianity. Or at least something posing as Christianity. And we have to know the word so well as to be able to navigate people's questions, people's doubts, people's skepticism. We should be spending time in the word and training that we might be prepared for those moments. Not just throwing out a verse here and there. But knowing the word, be a student of the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker has, who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. If any of you have played sports, you know, if you shoot, you're shooting free throws and um, taking batting practice, there's a thing called muscle memory, Right? When you get in there, you can't be thinking about how am I going to do this like this or a granny shot. No, you know, your body knows. When you're in the word and you're training yourself, when you understand that you're possessed and obsessed by Jesus Christ and the spirit is moving and you're expecting him to move, then we have to be prepared for those moments because they will come. Because we're expecting them, because we're seeing them. I'm afraid so many of us are walking right past these opportunities because we're not expecting it so be prepared some people have verses of scripture like pieces of a puzzle stuck in their pockets right but do you know Jesus can you be diligent have you looked at the front of the box do you know how it all comes together can you start in Isaiah or Genesis or or wherever and be able to have a conversation leading someone to the gospel in our neighborhood church I've mentioned this before some of our D groups, we study God's big picture, which basically takes from Genesis to Revelation and, and shows how it's all about Jesus. We've studied mere Christianity, um, don't lose your faith, all these things, all in an effort to equip one another as disciples to do the very thing that Philip did, meet our friends and neighbors and co-workers right where they're at with their misconceptions, meet them right there and lead them to Christ. Remember when I was in Bible college, I 
was a music student, and I said, during a service, I felt moved, like maybe God was calling me to take some preaching classes, you know, but I didn't feel called to be a preacher, and I was confused, and I, afterwards, I was just sitting there, and I was a little upset, and a pastor came over to me, he said, what's wrong, young man, and I told him, and he said, listen, open up your toolbox, stick your nose in the word, push into Jesus, and let him fill it up. Because you don't know what he's going to do. You don't know the plans he has for you. You don't know the people that he's going to put you in front of. You don't know that you're going to plant a church in New York City where you're going to have to preach every week. Let God equip you for this work. We don't, it's not on us. It's on us to press into Jesus, to study, to show ourselves approved. I find myself all the time watching YouTube de debate videos between humanists and Christian apologists and atheists and Christians and non-Christians. I, I want to know what people think, what they're talking about, what are their arguments. Because I know there's people all around me with those same things. Why does God let good things happen, bad things happen to good people? Why is there pain in the world? All those things. How will we respond when those moments come? Be prepared. Pay attention to your relationship with Jesus. Grow in it. And in that, you will become more and more sensitive to his spirit. Now, I know when you start talking about getting in the word and spending time in prayer, we kind of check out a little bit, right? Oh, what is this? Youth camp? I get it. I need a devotion. No, it's part of that being obsessed to know Jesus, as the Apostle Paul told us. To know Christ. Listen, you and I, this is what I figured out about people. We do what we want to do, period. So whatever things have come up in your mind about sharing the gospel or getting in the word and all those things, you do what you want to do. And so it may start with changing your want to, right? <laughs> like my dad used to say when I didn't want to cut the grass. Well, you better change your want to because you're going to. Preparing, knowing Christ more. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. Do you know the questions they're asking in the world today? I told you, the answer to gender dysphoria and uh, sexual, sexuality confusion, the, the Middle East crisis, the answer is Jesus Christ and going and bringing Christ. But how in the world do you get from a conversation about politics or sexuality to Jesus without just hitting somebody over the head with the Bible. It takes preparation. It takes it being a priority in my life to be prepared. Philip was ready. He said, where are you at? Okay, let's start right there. Let's just walk through it. I'm going to take you somewhere to Jesus. So it means going means being available. It means being prepared. And finally, it means being obedient, being bold. Verse 39, so Philip ran to him. I love that. He said, go. He ran. Heard him reading the, pro the prophet Isaiah. And in verse 35, it says, then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus Christ. Listen, this is where the rubber hits the road for a lot of us, folks that have been Christians a while. We love to talk to one another about Jesus, right? We, know, we love to read a new book about a devotional but taking it out there in our everyday lives is a different thing. You know, I know Pastor Paul has talked about this before, and sometimes uh, this has been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. I'm not sure that it, it was him, but anyway, he said, people say preach the gospel if necessary, use words. Why has this been so popular? Why is that so popular? Because, yes, it's necessary to use words. But the reason it's unpopular may be because we would rather not. I'll be a good person. I'll be a good neighbor. We have a synagogue just down the street from us that um, they don't even believe in God. It's atheist Judaism. They believe the Ten Commandments was just community guidelines on how we're to be good neighbors. Why is that? We don't want to offend. We don't want to be unliked. I don't know if I can say the right thing. 
All of these excuses are centered on myself, my own pride, right? My own protection. But our confidence is not in self. The Holy Spirit has already been dealing with this Ethiopian eunuch. So it's important for us to to engage, to make ourselves available and ready and engage in these conversations and not to panic. We don't panic. It's a God thing. God does his part. We're obedient and God does the supernatural part. It's It's not a sense of pass or fail. When Stephen preached his last message there before he was Murdered in Acts chapter 7, verse 57. He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. The bottom line is this is an interaction between the Holy Spirit and the soul of man. We're called to go. We're just called to be obedient. We have a lot of excuses. Not now, not here, not me. Me at the coffee shop. I had plenty of excuses. I'm behind. I have a message to give about sharing the gospel. I don't have time for this. But we are talking about eternity. We are talking about the eternity of our neighbors and our friends and our family members. What are we protecting? Here's some help. Number one, you can be confident, like I said before. This is a supernatural work of God. Sovereign power of God working in the heart of man, drawing them. Salvation is completely a supernatural thing. The draw... The pursuit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has chosen to work through people as well. This Ethiopian was lost. And he was reading this passage of Scripture. And see, this passage of Scripture, the different different Jewish people had different, um, understood this passage a little bit differently. Some thought the suffering servant in this Isaiah passage was the nation of Israel itself, as Israel had suffered greatly in wars and exile and persecution. Some thought the suffering servant was Isaiah writing about himself. Some thought the suffering servant was the Messiah, but they found this hard to accept because it's hard for the Jewish people to accept their Messiah suffering and not as a warrior king. God sent Philip to explain it, to unpack it for this man. He was prepared and he obeyed. So that guy at your work, that guy that you work alongside of or pass sometimes in your neighborhood, he may think he knows what a Christian is. He may think he knows what Christians are all about. He's probably got some messy stories maybe where he's been hurt, but God has sent you to explain what is true about Jesus and watch the supernatural power of him doing a work. And so walking through life sensitive, the spirit of God is working to bring people to salvation. It's interesting because it says, They were going along the road after this. They came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And so he stopped the chariot. He ordered the chariot. This is the eunuch doing all this. At this point, it's almost like Philip's just along for the ride. This eunuch, this Ethiopian, had an experience with God Almighty, with the Spirit of God. Philip was just obedient. Go this way. Go in the desert. Don't worry. I'm going to do a thing. And all of a sudden, he's going with the guy. Hey, baptize me right now, right here. The Spirit was working. It says in verse 39, And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Number one, he came up out of the water. I explain things like this at our church because there's a lot of confusion. He was submersed in this picture. That's just a side. Um, They came up out of the water, and this passage says that Philip was somehow supernaturally teleported away. And what does this guy do? Whoa, that was cool. No, he didn't even miss a beat. He's like praising God because something happened with God. Listen, God wants to use his people, us in this room, to reach Dothan. These songs that we sing about the sovereignty of God and him moving and bringing his kingdom on this earth. They're not just letters dropped out of airplanes. It's you, it's me that he's working in. His spirit is moving in us. To do a great thing. So, in conclusion, the church was small at this point, but it was growing through persecution. 
It's so, in, it's so interesting. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And then they kind of hung around a while. And then it says, out of persecution, they were driven out. God is accomplishing his purpose. The sovereign, supernatural power of a loving God bringing the message of redemption and salvation to this broken, hurting, rebellious planet. And he is working through you. His desire is to work through you and through me. And so is he working through your life tonight? Or are you working out your own plans? Are you preoccupied? Are you available? Are you prepared? And finally, are you being Obedient. James 4.17 says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. If we walk out of here and we are not going and sharing, we talk about building relationships all the time, and that's critical. But if we never step out in faith and speak the gospel, it's not merely moving to the Middle East as a missionary which is great. Or someday, if someone holds a gun to your head and says, are you a Christian? Obedient faith is going to that neighbor, that coworker, that family member, maybe that you see every day, or it may be someone you will cross paths with today or this week, and pointing them to Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross where he hung and died that we might tell. And so my prayer for you and for me tonight is that we'll surrender everything to Christ as we go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and grace. Thank you that you pursued me. Thank you that you pursued me and you worked through someone going to me. And God, too often we get too clever. We get too... Um, we get too intellectual about it. We think about it too much rather than going, taking a step of faith and trusting you for the supernatural that only you can do, and that is changing the heart, changing eternity in someone's life. God, there's so many things in this world. That the world is so loud right now. We see it. We got it in our pocket, in our hand, in our cars, in our homes, everywhere. It's loud. There's so many things calling for our attention, calling for our allegiance. God, and the temptation is to just blend into the world, to pursue the things the world pursues. Lord, wake us from our slumber tonight. There's not some great geopolitical movement or solution solution is the gospel going. May we be obedient in that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.